So uh, welcome everyone to the Feng Shui Society. I can't see myself on screen, but hopefully you can see me. Um, it, we have a very, very special guest. We have our lovely Maureen Kalamia. Kalamia, and I practice uh, pronouncing your sur surname, Maureen. Um, Maureen is joining us from a lovely sunny New York. We're very delighted to have you here. Uh, Maureen is the author of Luminous Spaces, and she's also the founder of Luminous Spaces School in 2015. And she um, offers consulting, she offers coaching and training to businesses and residential clients using the concepts of feng shui, um, connecting with nature and a psychology, right. as well biophilic design which is what we are going to be seeing her present this evening so thank you Maureen I am going to um leave the floor to you and um switch off <laughs> okay thank you well. so much Victoria for the introduction and um I am I'm so delighted to be here today because I have uh, I'm also on the International Feng Shui Guild board well I was I served on the board for the IFSG for 10 years and our two organizations are um kindred spirits um I am delighted to speak with you today about something that I'm really passionate about and I feel like as feng shui practitioners there is just such a an amazing linkage between these two disciplines and I am so excited to share my thoughts with you today um, and as Victoria mentioned, I, um, some of my um, passions, I am author of a book, Creating Luminous Spaces, which is really about the five elements of our beloved feng shui. And I'm just so passionate about the archetypes that those five elements give us such like a rich layered discipline that, that we have in feng shui. And really my passion for all of this comes from our connection to the land and to the natural world. And I always felt that there was this amazing um, magical tool with the five elements to help us each connect in a much deeper way to the natural world. And so I, you know, most of my practice is really focused on the land so form school feng shui, um, earth energy healing and dowsing, and of course the five elements. So um, I will talk to you about how, you know, how I got here with um, this discipline. So first, as always, I like to do just a quick little grounding uh, brief visualization. So wherever you are, if you can put your feet on the floor, maybe your hands gently in your lap and close your eyes just lightly and just breathe into the moment. Feel the breath enter your body. Filling up your energy field and exhaling out, feeling that energy field soften. And imagine some place that you're in, some place that you've been to perhaps, or a place that's imaginal, a place that gives you a sense of calm and peace. Breathe into that space and feel that peace, balance, and harmony in your energy field and in your body. All right, just two more deep breaths here. Then 
And when you're ready, just gently open your eyes and re-engage in the space. It's no surprise that when I do this meditation, most people, you know, when I ask, where were you? They were in some place in nature, not usually in a room or a building, although it does happen. But most of us gravitate when we think of a place that's peaceful, nurturing, and supportive. We think about a beautiful place in nature. And all we can do when we do feng shui or interior design is just try our best to mimic that in our spaces, right? I mean, that's what we do with feng shui. We try to create this beautiful peace and harmony mimicking how nature does it. And when it does it right, there's nothing better than that. Nature makes us feel both calm, which is yin, and alive and vibrant, which is yang. So it somehow nurtures those both op opposing factors. And that's what makes us feel better in those spaces. But we spend 90% of our time indoors. Most of us, actually they say the average American spends 90 to 95% of their time indoors. And I'm sure it's not that different wherever you live. And oftentimes we spend places, we spend our time in places like this. Maybe not you or I, but our clients, absolutely. And it's just so conducive to anxiety and stress. And we know that in our feng shui practice. So what is this biophilic design? It's a strange word. Um, some of you may know some about it and some it may be completely new. In fact, I would love to get an idea. Uh, I don't know if we can do a chat on that. Um, I would love to hear how many people have never heard of it before because now I think it's, well, I'll talk where we are now. First, let me just talk about what it is. So. It comes from this word biophilia. And this term was coined back in the 1950s or 60s by psychologist Eric Fromm. And he's, he created this to mean the love of living things. That as humans, we, we inherently are attracted to life. It makes a whole lot of sense. Biophilic design is about maintaining, enhancing, and restoring the experience of nature in our built environments. It's evolved out of sustainable design or design that strives for a lower impact on the environment, lower than typical. Um, the construction industry accounts for 40% of all waste globally. Pretty stunning, 40%. So one thing, I forgot to put this in my notes, but it just came to my mind now, is how sustainable is a building when we don't love that building? Think about it. Buildings that last are buildings that we love and we fight for. I think about New York City, we've got Pennsylvania Station, Grand Central Station, both built around the same time. I don't remember exactly when, I think the late 1800s, early, yeah, late 1800s, I believe. Um, Penn Station was leveled and Madison Square Garden and the office plaza was built above it. Grand Central Station was gonna be leveled and had the same path, yet people rose up. In fact, Jackie Kennedy, um, Onassis, was the first like celebrity to rise up and create the um, conservation for Grand Central. And I'm sure you have many spaces where you live that 
um, are fortunately uh, saved because people rose up because they loved these spaces. So that is one thing we really have to be careful about, right? Um, we can build all these buildings, but they will not have longevity. They will be torn down in another building and how much waste is that, right? So that's really an important part of this. Um, so sustainability comes from, um, well, in the US, the US Green Building Council developed LEED, which is the Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design, which you are probably familiar with. And I'm sure you have some counterparts in Europe for that. Um, for the most part, LEED is focused on limiting waste and minimizing energy consumption. That's how it started. It was really about those two things. What they did not take into account were these buildings that were getting, you know, platinum lead and they were soul sucking concrete boxes. They may have hit all the, you know, ticked all the boxes for um, using recycled product and, you know, lower energy consumption and all that, but they were not places that people loved. They were not places where people had a feeling of greater well-being. So this idea of focusing on what's like restorative design brings it all together. And it, it's, it's just places where not only we are lighter and kinder to the environment, but we're also lighter and kinder to the human occupants of the space. So what evolved was this new discipline about bringing the outside in. And one of my students posted this photo on our private group and I, I just, just like gobsmacked. Um, I love volcanoes, um, always had a thing about volcanoes as a child. This is a photo, I believe from the Azores um, a lava flow that was incorporated into the building of, I believe it's an art gallery. And I just thought, oh my gosh, how like amazing that is. I mean, literally bringing the outside in. So Professor Kellert, he's a former professor emeritus at Yale University at the School of Environmental Studies and Forestry. He and another gentleman, E.O. Wilson, and you may know of him, he's a biologist. He's written many, many books and he's an amazing soul. Um, in his 90s, um, still going for it. Uh, Professor Keller, we lost a few years ago, unfortunately. But the two of them actually came up with this idea of taking biophilia, which is our love of living things, and adapting it to design and coming up with a framework of how architects, designers, developers, anyone to do with the built environment could use to help create spaces. So they needed to kind of come up with this like structure of principles to think about. And when I first came across biophilic design, it was through Google searching. Um, I am sure it had words like nature and buildings and something like that. And I came across this back in, I think 2007, 2008. And it was a PowerPoint presentation by Professor Keller. And going through this presentation, I went, this is feng shui, this is feng shui, oh my God. Like, Feng Shui at its most basic, fundamental core. That is how I see it. So I was just lit up, inspired. I saw that there was actually research behind this and went, wow, okay, you've got my attention. I want to learn more. So I purchased this book that's on the left, Biophilic Design. It's a textbook tons and tons of essays from people in all disciplines, anybody related from environmental psychologists to sociologists, um, developers, everybody. 
is in this book um, represented. And I was, I was, yeah, I was on my way. Um, I was really, really, um, well, I, I'm kind of a bold person. If I get inspired by somebody, um, I just reach out. So I emailed him and said, hey, I'm coming up to Connecticut in a few weeks. I would love to meet with you. And he agreed. So I went up to Yale and sat in his office. He gave me an hour of his time. And I told him, I do feng shui. And he was like, oh, okay. Um, and I said, you know, I, I really, um, I think there's just such a connection. And he agreed. He said, I think biofield of design is a modern expression of feng shui. And he said, you know, I don't know all the details of feng shui. I've never really studied it, but I do know that it's there. It's really there. That's where the roots of biofield of design are. And I told him about my book that I was writing. Um, took me 10 years to write. Um, not that it took me so long to write, but trying to figure out my focus for the book. And I told him, I said, I want to kind of bring these two disciplines together. And he was so supportive and said, let me know. I'll take a read, um, anything. He, he really was um, wonderful and very open-minded. So unfortunately, I wasn't able to get him to look at the book he had, he had passed, but he has been really um, a, an, a, an important mentor for me in this whole process. So, so I just did this Venn diagram because I love Venn diagrams. Got feng shui, we got biofield design, and I cannot, you know, um, I cannot think of things without the lens of yin and yang and the five elements. It's just imp impossible. I'm sure you feel the same. So I'm like, wow, feng shui is the yin, where biophilic design is the yang. Because feng shui, yes, we have principles. We have um, one of my friends, Anne Bingley Gallops. Some of you may know. I love this quote that she said. In feng shui, we have tools, not rules. And it's so true because it is too fluid to be put in a box and be rigid. So feng shui is so much more fluid and poetic in our language. And that's what I love, the metaphor, the symbolism that feng shui represents. And that connection with the subconscious mind is incredible. What biofield design has, it has a language that is measurable. It has research behind it. It is structured, probably too structured um, for its own good, but in a way it needed to be structured in order to get adopted by the very community that looks for structure. So, um, but these two have a major overlap. So when I started reading about feng shui, I just latched on to this one piece of research and I and this is what really got me, really got me. So back in the 70s, Texas A&M University professor of architecture, um, Roger Yolrich, he decided, or he had this hypothesis that he wanted to prove. So he picked, you know, the hospital, patients going for gallbladder surgery, they had two different rooms for recovery and it took a few days to recover from surgery. Maybe it's different now, but back in the seventies, you were in the hospital for a few days. So they were very, very careful with how they selected who went into each room and it was random, but it, it was also careful that it didn't load up one type of pathology against another. So real random sample. Over 10 years, they gathered research. They gathered as much data as they could from the recovery of these two different rooms. One room, after, you know, 10 years of research, they looked one room had half the nurse calls 
that same room had a third of the painkillers than patients in the other room. And they were discharged almost a full day earlier than the other group. And finally, they did surveys where they were self-reporting. And on the surveys, they were giving themselves um, reporting higher level of well-being. The only difference between these two rooms was one had a view of nature and one had a view of a building wall, a wall. That is it. This was published in one of the journals and well, a lot of um, researchers just, you know, but others went, wow, there's something here. And it's kind of maybe one of the earliest studies of environmental psychology um, that's out there. And if you just Google gallbladder study, you will read the whole thing. It's pretty remarkable. So biophilic design wasn't just developed overnight, right? It's been there and it's been unnamed for decades, but actually this formulation between Kellard and Wilson was in the late nineties. They did conferences at Rhode Island. Um, uh, they, they, you know, started writing books and they wrote a number of books together about it, but Way back in the early 1900s, we had architects like Frank Lloyd Wright and others that used this kind of concept of bringing nature inside or connecting better to nature in our indoor spaces. It was kind of called organic design. And well, there's, these are some photos that I took. I was so lucky last year to get to um, visit Falling Water, which is you know I, his iconic home in uh, outside of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And I went twice, actually the first time I went, I had an opportunity to go. It was during COVID and we couldn't go in. And then last year I had another opportunity to go and we were able to go inside. So I was like, I gotta do it again. So um, that picture on the left, which is the most iconic photo, I actually took that in the spot where you take that photo. Um, anyhow, um, really amazing and yes, this is not the best feng shui um, home for sure. I know we could all sit here and debate about the, the qualities, good and bad about this space, um, but it is definitely was uh, an attempt to really connect the human occupants to the natural environment around them by literally placing them over that waterfall. So both feng shui and biophilic design are about activating and engaging our senses. When that happens, we are more present. We're embodied. We're in that space rather than just being in our heads and being chaotic and stressed. We are fully embodied. And I love this quote, the human mind and body evolved in a sensorially rich world, one that continues to be critical to people's health, productivity, emotional, intellectual, and even spiritual well-being. I think it's so well said. We were meant to be in, space, in spaces that really made us feel alive, yet calm at the same time. So in this photo, I like to look, uh, you know, we've got the gentleman under a tree with um, the dappled sunlight coming through the leaves. And then we've got this space that kind of takes that idea in an architectural design way with the dappled sunlight coming through. And obviously this whole scene changes as the day progresses from morning to, to evening. So it's it's got you know movement. It's got light. It's got um, feeling of not being um, concentrated by that sunlight. The glass, the arc, the shadow. Shadow is really really important to consider, right? The yin and the yang. So, in studying 
biofield of design since 2008, say, um, I started noticing, actually, it was when I was writing my book, I started like going, hmm, okay, I love the five elements. I classify everything by the five elements. Can I classify biofield design principles? That idea came to me while I was sitting on the beach. I spent a lot of time at the beach watching the little waves come in. And I just sat there with my notebook and I'm like, okay, this is clearly earth. Oh, this is clearly fire. Oh, and I just, I mean, 20 minutes later, I pretty much had the whole thing figured out. And I thought, wow, that's pretty cool. Pretty cool. I think I found like a real key to how feng shui and biofield of design work. It's all about five elements. So there are, since Keller and Wilson created biofield of design structure and principles, there's been so many um, variations on it. Taking what they learned, and even Keller and Wilson, Keller mostly, kind of was like playing with it in the early 2000s and going, okay, you know, ooh, my first attempt in 1999, maybe I need to winnow it down or move things around. And he, he created a few versions of it. Um, then another organization, Terrapin Bright Green, a biophilic design consulting firm came in and created their own and got rid of some of the more fluid, intuitive things that actually Keller had in there and, and made it a little drier. But I understand the reason because they wanted to appeal to more like measurable things, not subjective. So very objective. Um, and then Keller um, wrote his last book um, and came up with another version, which is the latest, which is the one that I look to and the one that I love. Um, is looking at three major um, categories of the direct experience of nature in the space, an indirect experience of nature, as well as the experience of the space and place itself. And as I'm saying these, you probably are like, oh yeah, I, I see feng shui in this, um, definitely. Um, so I also, in, in looking at this, I also realized that, especially as feng shui practitioners and many interior designers, we're not designing new buildings, right? We're not in, most of us are not involved in the development of a whole new building. Maybe some renovations, but I realized that these principles can be adopted at all levels, just like we do with feng shui. So I created this schema that I pretty much created in that 20 minutes sitting on the beach um, of these major ideas broken out into the five elements. And, and this chart is in my book, Creating Luminous Spaces. And although my book's not about biofuel of design, it's about the five elements, I do bring these to life in the book in a, in a more layperson way. So I translated, there's really 14 principles behind the three primary ones. And I kind of laid them over these elements. Um, and um, I'm going to go over them right now. Very lightly. So we have the first wood element. I always start with wood, you know, the rising sun, the east. Um, the wood element, I, I gave the name of movement and vitality because in the wood element, it's all about um, plants, right? It's about vegetation, but it's also about our views of nature outside our windows, uh, our views of the trees and the flowers. It's also about natural landscapes and ecosystems, connection with natural processes of nature. So if there's you know, a meadow and how it changes and evolves over, the, the span of the year, or if there's a creek and it, you know, changes its flow, 
those are things about really connecting with the natural process of the land. Something that's really um, number one in feng shui is the vitality of the land. That is also, um, I consider it in this. So really that the health of the ecosystem itself. And um, yeah, so, you know, these are just obvious, some obvious ways. I've got a creek here. I've got a green wall, which they're awesome. And of course, some like um, plant-based fabrics and colors of green and all that, which is, brings us to our feng shui roots. Okay, the fire element obviously is all about illumination, but because the archetype is about that deep need to connect with others, um, I felt that was a really important part of this um, element. So it, of course, it's related to real fire. So fireplaces, fire pits and candles, lighting, so artificial. Um, we definitely would say that in feng shui. And because feng shui talks about wildlife or you know humans, um, animals all being fire, I included that having animals in our spaces or, or having the ability to connect with them. So like a bird feeder outside your window or a bird bath kind of draws them in. And fire is also about affection and playfulness. And believe it or not, in Kellett's original, or one of his original um, principles of biophilic design, he does talk about having that playfulness and affection in our spaces. So I really loved that and wanted to make sure I incorporated that. So finally, we get to um, the earth element and I call this transition and balance. I feel like earth is such a grounding influence in the five elements and earth kind of allows all the other elements to kind of be in their fullness. Um, and I see um, earth as kind of the um, backdrop in a way. It, it, it allows everything to kind of happen and take place. So I looked at qualities like this sense of place, getting a real feel for where you are geographically. So think about um, probably in the last couple of decades, airports, whenever um, new ones are being built, they do seem to have a pretty good um, feel of where you are now versus, you know, a few decades ago, you could have landed in um, I don't know, Dallas maybe, and it could have been New York or it could have been Chicago and you wouldn't have had a feel for the sense of place. Um, but now that's really being in, considered and incorporated. So that I feel like is very much connected to the earth and, and grounded. The orientation on the land, how the building is, uh, sits and how it feels. Um, prospect and refuge, I love this. Um, prospect and refuge are a sophisticated term for command position or power position. Um, and they say that it's this, you know, we know in feng shui that it's, you know, ingrained through evolution in our brains. We're standing maybe on the edge of the savanna and we're hunting. We want to have our back protected by some um, trees or thick vegetation so we are protected from being attacked from the back but yet we have a view so that is um very much about orienting in the right places in the right way also something they call information richness which i see exactly what yin and yang is and variety and balance all these things have to do with making sure that there's not too much of yin or yang or elementally too much of one, el one element that could kind of just create a little imbalance in the space. And also, um, lastly, it is about use of local materials. As you can imagine, kind of a sense of place 
if there's stonework, um, to have it quarried locally is going to be so much more impactful and grounding than having it shipped in from across the country. So um, that is also part of the earth element. I'm just checking here. So I just picked a few images here. We've got, um, of course, um, some stonework in this building. Uh, I can't remember. I think it's, I think it's hospitality. Um, beautiful local stonework. We've got an image of um, these chairs that have this beautiful view out the window and makes it feel very grounded. Also, the earth element, as we know in feng shui, is very horizontal and low to the ground type of furniture. So I felt these were very much very earthy. And um, the other picture is just kind of showing like um, this prospect and record idea. Okay, so the metal element I call shiny and clear. And um, there's the idea of incorporating beauty and order and complexity. This is um, really cool because there has to be some kind of order, but richness and depth that like sacred geometry or fractals can bring. Um, so the same pattern at many different levels. Um, a lot of our older buildings do this really well um, in molding and you know throughout spaces. Uh, let's see what else. Weather, okay. Um, actually having open windows for the airflow, but also an ability to look out and, and see, you know, what's approaching storms or the sun or, you know, it's, it's turning to night. That's really important. I always connect the metal element with air and the sky because of the fact that it's connected with, to the lung system in Chinese medicine. So I feel that um, anything related to the air, breezes, sound is metal. Um, having, you know, like curtains blowing in the breeze gives something called um, non-rhythmic patterning of nature. Um, and also because the metal element is connected with the, the heaven, right? The father and the heavens, I connect it. And also to, I connect it with ceremony and spirituality um, in a way. And I see it being the spirit of place. So we have a sense of place, which was more grounded and earthy and geography based kind of, or resource based. This is more kind of the essence and the spirit of the land. And lastly, we have the water element. I call it wabi-sabi and flow. Um, so water, of course, is any kind of water in the environment, um, curves, a good flow of chi around a space. Um, I love some of the concepts that are I attribute to the water element and I feel really belong here. Um, one is called mystery and enticement. So like in this one image in the lower left, we have this lighting kind of curving up onto a pathway. It's beckoning us. There's a sense of mystery. What's at the end of that path? Um, and this is part of biophilic design. So it's kind of creating that in our spaces. There's also the sense of awe, incorporating the sense of awe. So, you know, could be, this is, you know, photographs of like the Grand Canyon or something that's awe inspiring or bringing in, you know, or a view, um, you know, there's just so many ways to do it. Um, height is also very good for a sense of awe. Looking down, you know, perhaps it's a 
it's a building with an atrium and you've got an overlook onto that atrium and it's awe, like, wow, the volume of the space is awesome. There's also the concept of changing over time. So when we have things like Formica, they don't really change. I mean, I guess they could get chipped and dirty and stuff, but it's not alive. We've got a table made of wood. That wood is going to get a patina on it from our hands, the oils, from our use. Um, over time, it's going to change. And there's a certain satisfaction that we get from that. Um, that's kind of hard to place. Um, I also pair on to here authenticity. So just kind of really spaces that feel authentic, that just feel real. Um, and then finally, the other component of this is kind of like mystery and enticement. It's called risk and peril. That's right, risk and peril. And peril is obviously something we think we should avoid at all costs in our spaces. But it's like having something that there's a little risk involved, but there's a complete safeguard. So back to that atrium, that height, looking over the balcony, you might get a sense of awe, but also a sense of, oh, huh, I wouldn't want to fall off here. But yet you, and, and there's, so there's peril and a little fear, but you've got a safe, you know, um, balcony railing that's going to keep you and protect you. Um, another would be maybe like a diving board on a pool. There's the sense of risk and peril there, but you know, it's, it's gonna be fine. But not so much, I guess, in our homes, in those uh, illustrations perhaps, but it's more of like public spaces um, that this really comes in. So um, think about, you know, like when I teach this, I always, I'm like, give me examples of what you see or what you remember of a space that gives you that feeling of mystery and enticement or risk and peril and share that. It's, it's really fun. Um, those are really fun aspects of the water element. So when an environment feels right, when we can witness the passage of time in a space and the evolution of change in materials, like the weathering of the wood or patina changing in the metals, it is just, it, it just creates a place that feels more huga, um, more rich. I love this image. Um, it's a, an office space, a little conference or meeting area. So feng shui is a poetic, I feel energetic and intuitive language. And be, biophilic design is the more structured, linear, logical approach. And together I feel they create magic, having these two together. Biofield design is growing tremendously. So back in 2008, maybe 2009 or 10, I did a little Google alert. Um, most of you probably know what that is, but you put in a phrase and in Google and it will email you every time that phrase is used. Um, and you can say, I want it daily or I want it weekly or whatever. Um, so I did that. And I think I put it weekly. I got like one every few weeks, an email. Here we are in 2023. I get like three emails a day. And sometimes there's six or seven articles talking about biophilic design. COVID certainly helped um, boost biophilic design. I think it 
helped boost feng shui too. Um, people started looking at their homes in a different way. They realized, okay, well, I'm not just like sleeping here and running and doing everything else. I'm actually having to live here 24 seven. People got into plants much more than ever before, hoping those plants are still alive and then they didn't get tossed out after they got bored. But um, hopefully this trend continues, but people are starting to realize that our environments are not just a backdrop. They inform and impact our lives significantly, like we know with feng shui. So I teach a biofield design certification program. It's a six module course. Um, in that, I you'll learn things like what are the top five elements that people want in their office spaces? And I'm not talking about the five elements, you know. Um, yeah, so natural light, number one. Yeah. Indoor plants, quiet working space, view of the sea. Yeah, that would be nice. Uh, bright colors. Um, but also you'll learn about solutions to improve a space that have no windows. I have done that. Um, and actually just had one of my students complete a project that she was, um, it was a pro bono for a school for autistic children. They bought a warehouse with no windows and they wanted to create a school. And boy, did they do an amazing job. And so she reported back to everybody about how it went and what they did and and gave us all ideas. Um, research findings, tons of research findings that often you'll go, wow, yeah, okay, well, this backs up feng shui too. It's not just biofuel of design. Um, real world applications and a supportive, vibrant Facebook community. Um, and, you know, Obviously, these are all things that I think we could say as a feng shui practitioner, we do work with. Um, absolutely contributes to health and well-being, enhances productivity, increases creativity, counterbalance technology. That, that's really huge. Um, maybe feng shui doesn't do that so much. I mean, it's all about the nature aspect of it, right? Um, yeah, you could say counterbalances because we sometimes look at EMFs and things like that. But one of the authors that really inspired me, Richard Louvre, um, L-O-U-V, he wrote a book called The Last Child in the Woods. Um, and this was right when I was learning about biophilic design. And I just went, oh my God, that title just, just like was a, a punch in the stomach. And in there, he talks about, you know, the balance, you know, technology isn't bad. In fact, we couldn't do this without it. But what's bad is the imbalance, right? We know that too much yang and not enough yin. So we need to counterbalance all that, all this increased technology with increased exposure in nature, being outdoors, but also bringing it indoors. So that's really cool. That's really critical. Um, deepening the human nature connection. If we all, and I'm pretty sure we'd all agree, we're gonna have a bright future, but we only can get there if more and more people become more aware of this human nature bond. Um, and it is the way of the future. So I have all different uh, backgrounds that are have come to my course. Now, I have to say that I was really nervous when I created the course. And I, well, well, who am I to talk to an interior designer? I am not one. Um, or to talk to an architect? I am not one. Or a developer or somebody who makes, you know, is involved in um, major building developments or urban planning, none of that. So I thought, you know, I can definitely teach biophile design to feng shui practitioners. It, it is so important. 
Um, and I feel so passionate about it. And when I talk to others in the field, they also were like, wow, really? That's cool. So I developed this with feng shui practitioners in mind. So it's all about connecting these concepts to different concepts that we have in feng shui. What I found was I started getting people from all walks of life, um, architects, interior designers, sustainability consultants, wellness coaches, artists, workplace consultants, landscape designers, healthcare, education. I've had a couple of um, teachers, you know, high school teachers, college professors that wanted to learn about biophilic design to work in their, um, in their careers to make their spaces better for the students. Um, nursing practitioners and energy healers. So, uh, and the list keeps growing. I, I'm, I'm just so grateful to the expansiveness of what biofield of design can do for us. And um, I am teaching it live, although I have offered it for um, self-study. It is always available as a self-study, um, which gives you the vibrant Facebook community. And we do, um, I have videos of live classes, but I am gonna teach it live again. It's just six weeks in a row in the fall. And um, so I just thought I would let you know about that. What I did when I created this program is I focus on each element and go into depth, um, giving not only the linkages between feng shui and biophilic design, but applications, um, solutions based on those principles. And I also realized it needed another layer of depth because there's all different types of um, case studies and um, research. So I overlaid um, this um, spaces. So we kind of focus on different industries and I paired them, I think, I think pretty well with the elements. So for the fire element, I have the hospitality spaces. For the water element, I paired it with healthcare. The earth element is residential. The wood element is workspaces and more corporate spaces. And the metal element are all the others, you know, civic um, environments, both indoor and outdoor, um, all man-made environments. So just a few. Um, of the testimonials. So I'm just doing a time check. Oh my gosh. Okay. <laughs> it's all good. All good. <laughs> oh my gosh. So Victoria, um, I see there's chats, but I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Um, just double checking. So uh, would you like me to get into the chats now? Have you finished? Um, with I, have. I have. <laughs> okay. So um, lots in the chat. Some people, uh, I asked them to do a poll, whether they'd heard, you know, a yes or no for have I heard of the biophilic uh, term and some yeses, some noes, a bit of balance really here. Um, I have some comments. Um, uh, let me see, uh, I, um, Elizabeth has said, I keep reading biophilic design as biophilic design, understanding what looks, what books have to do with feng shui, not. Elizabeth, um, if you're there, would you like to unmute and uh, give some context to your mental question? Uh, it's when you read it quickly, up until tonight, I read it bibliophilic, design you know like a bibliotheca or where where you have books that's what i read it as until i arrived tonight and and i and when uh, maureen started said biophilic and i thought oh so I, I was completely on a different tangent thinking there was something about books you know libraries or whatever but not bio as in life you see so that's why i read it wrong <laughs> So, so I, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, 
uh, it was, is that a, did you have a question or? No, I just, uh, I never heard that uh, about that before. So I just read it wrong and read it as bibliophilic. I see, I see. Stand. Yes, yes, yes. yes and when I read it's now not bio term. is life, you see? Yes. Different. Yes. Right. No, thank you. Um, now we know how to spell the word correctly, and now we know what the term means. Thank you, Maureen. <laughs> and um, uh, thank you for that, Elizabeth. Um, and Amanda, Amanda, you've got your hand up. Please go ahead. Sorry, just had to unmute myself. Um, yeah, I am. Um, funnily enough, I was in a, a Zoom meeting uh, this afternoon with a group of people that I do work with and work with. Uh, one of them mentioned biophilic uh, design because we we're talking about sustainability and the importance of being in touch with nature. And then someone else said, actually, my house is designed according to that. And so she gave us a little guided tour with her with her ta tablet or laptop or whatever. Um, but what she focused on, I mean, obviously it's a big subject and I appreciate you can't cover everything in, 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 in an hour or less. Um, but she was talking about how the windows had all, they had these huge windows and they were all on, because she'd had the house built for her, which not many of us have the uh, privilege of doing, but they were all on the side that get, uh, faces the sun. And then she had, she's in America, so obviously probably hotter weather, but so she had a, uh, canopy above the, exactly at the right height so that when the sun's at a certain height it protects her from the heat and then I mean it's seemingly if uh, houses are designed according to these various principles that she showed us um, we can uh, consume 75 percent less energy um, and it was all very fascinating um, those aren't aspects that you've mentioned in terms of making the best use of them. I mean maybe you do in your course I don't know I just wonder. No. No, well, that, um, like heat gain, that really isn't biophilic design. That is more sustainable design. Um, and it's it, it talks about lowering the energy consumption. And yes, to make the place more um, comfortable temperature wise, but that's really not biophilic design. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was beautifully but, designed anyway. So maybe, but, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, all right. But Thanks. yes, they, they work very well together. And if you have a consultant, they're going to do both mm -hmm. um, if they're if they're good, right? They're going to, you know, an architect is going to bring in, um, uh, you know, the aspects of of the site itself, the path of the sun, and also the um, the weather, you know, there. It, you know, I know I, I have been working with an architect in South Africa, and it's super hot uh it, you know in different parts of the year so it's they have to really be careful um so their their um applications are different but that's more of a sustainable right i mean it's it's harnessing nature though isn't it because i mean i, I went to visit somewhere i can't remember uh, in liverpool i think which is a few hundred years old and that was also built so that you know, when the winds blew in a certain direction, you know, et cetera, et cetera, created air conditioning sort of, it. you know, it's right. like, it, this knowledge goes back for centuries, clearly. Um, right, right. Um, but yeah, that, that requires a lot more training. I mean, that's the architects yeah. um, that need to get that kind of training. We, we don't, uh, you know, as biophilic design, um, unless they're architects, they don't have really that kind of training yet. Right. Yeah. Okay, anyway, fascinating stuff. Brilliant, Amanda, great question. Yes. Um, we've got a couple of comments. David, David, you hear, uh, David commented, the very community that looks the structure. I think he's referring to um, your, um, David, if you're here, if you, if you want to come online and provide the context, if you are here. Oh, hi. So yeah, yeah. Um, basically, yeah, I'm for I forgot which slide it was, but basically it was, but uh, I put in quotation mo uh, quotations that you actually said something. I can't remember what, but basically it's there. It like, um, obviously like you said that, and then obviously, wow, that was such a lovely phrase. I mean, and also I also wanted to say like, one of the slides where you actually made like a five point star a pentagram basically it's just like lovely um describe the nature and religion slash spirituality and just like how 
space. Well, I guess it's all opinion, but basically, like, depending on religion, spirituality, just getting more towards the nature slash earth. But uh, that was like a lovely slide on the five elements. So that's uh, context for my comments. Very cool. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, um, there, there's so much inspiration, I think, if if this is like what you're gravitating toward. Um, and and personally, I don't know how a feng shui consultant wouldn't be lit up by this, but because um, that's just me, I guess. But it it is it, it just invites you to um, to study more it's it's incredible and I feel very much like feng shui in that aspect uh you know I can never stop learning about feng shui and learning the layers um just incredible brilliant thank you um another comment here from sherry sherry I don't know if you're still online uh, basically she says in America uh, we have green build certification and bringing nature into the home is part of the certification. Using local woods, uh, wood panelling, pulling plants into the home. Uh, Sherry, if you're here, I'd invite you to expand on your comment if you'd like. Can you hear me? Yes. Ah, well, I actually got eight acres and built a home that's a green build. It's certified green build, certified energy star, and certified net zero. Um, awesome. Yeah, and part of that design, I actually had a feng shui specialist do um, help me with it to place the home on the on the land properly. Um, all of my windows face due south for the energy savings, not the feng shui part. But like I've got live edge shelving in my kitchen instead of cabinets made from local poplar. It's absolutely beautiful. Um, live edge would be the bark is gone, but everything else is left natural, just like the tree was cut down. Beautiful, um, yeah. And I've got local wood paneling, and I've got concrete floors instead of carpeting. And I've got <laughs> there's a lot of different things going on in this house, but uh, rounded edges, rounded the both ends of the house are rounded instead of squared, which was a challenge feng shui wise. <laughs> Anyway, just a, yeah, a, just a yeah. Oh, that sounds lovely, Sherry. Um, so you have you definitely have aspects of biophilic design in your space, even though maybe that term wasn't used. No, the term was not used when I was building. Um, I've also stenciled like vines hanging down from the ceiling and flowers in the bathrooms, and I know they're not real, but they do give a warmth. Um, where I can't have live plants because there's not enough light. <laughs> right. That's great. Oh, wonderful. Absolutely. And I think we've got uh, one last question from Elizabeth again, actually. Elizabeth, if you're there. Elizabeth, yeah. Elizabeth is asking, would you design a workplace where people go in one to three days a week, uh, as in a hybrid working the same as a full-time office? Oh yeah, um, absolutely. Um, good question. Um, if, if the organization can, I mean, you know, just like feng shui, there's, you know, there's different levels of project cost, right? Um, I've worked with people who have nothing really to work with. You know, we're working with a couple of hundred dollars. It's, you know, but there's things you can do. We know that, you know, you can orient yourself better in the space for prospect and refuge or man position. You could bring some plants in or ask employees to bring plants in if they can't afford it. Um, some artwork, absolutely, because it's critical. I have found that learning about biophilic design, I can help my clients so much more in their home office spaces. Um, and then I give them suggestions if they can do something in their work office. Um, I do some corporate speaking events for major corporations talking to their staff about how they can create 
spaces for better productivity. Like what company doesn't want that? That That is one really wonderful thing about biofield design is it gives you a different language um, where you may appeal to a certain type of person talking about feng shui and not another because they're just like, oh, feng shui, you know, it's, it's, you know, woo woo, right? We hear that all the time. It's woo woo. Um, but biophilic design, because it's got research behind it, and it shows that people have greater productivity, less turnover, less absences in spaces that have even some semblance of biophilic design. It doesn't have to be like Google's brand new headquarters, which is all built with biophilic design and lead, you know, green building certification and all that, but biophilic design is part of it because they want the best productivity. They want to have less turnover. They want their employees to be happier because it's better for the bottom line. So yes, absolutely. Um, even if somebody's only in a space one day a week, it's it's important. Yeah. Yes, yes. Thanks. Thank yeah. you. Brilliant. Uh, thank you for that answer, Elizabeth. I hope uh, hopefully that answered your question beautifully. Yes. <laughs> Great. And just a quick comment from Tracy to uh, Sherry, a message from her saying, uh, when you spoke about your house earlier on, she says, she, uh, I think she means it, can you show us around, Sherry, your house sounds lovely. <laughs> so that's from Tracy to you. Um, okay, I'm conscious of time, but just a comment to yourself, Maureen, from myself. Personally, um, I've become really fascinated with this subject. Uh, I hadn't heard of this a, a particular term before. And I really love um, proof of concept. I love anything that's evidence-based because if you can measure it, you can change it. So I um, very much um, like your research kind of aspect, your presentation, the logical head behind something is really interesting for me. Um, yeah, uh, so that's just uh, my little uh, input from myself. And for all of you who are still here, our next uh, Feng Shui Society presentation is on the 10th of September, the same time, UK time, from 7 to 8 p.m. Might run over slightly with Q&As. And the presenter is Lawrence Anglais. He is a Feng Shui consultant practitioner teacher, and he's going to be talking about um, Feng Shui and the Qi blocks, which um, stop you from manifesting your best life. So that is our next speaker. And um, I guess a um, heartful thank you from ourselves again to you, Maureen. We are honored to have had you here tonight and uh, wish you the best and very much success and hope to, if you promise to come back again, basically. Aw, thank you so much. It's It was such a pleasure talking with you all. Okay. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Have a lovely evening or morning, wherever you are <laughs> across the globe. Bye. Bye. Bye.